I'm going to give you a little bit of background about our very, very special guest tonight, Dr. Le David Lewis Anderson, who is a physicist and discoverer of time warp field technology. David Anderson um, is actually um, provided one of the most comprehensive overviews of the historical views of time, time control, and the time travel in his documentary called Time Travel Journeys into Time. His ideas were later applied for the development of high performance time reactor systems for energy production and time technology research at Anderson Multinational. Dr. Anderson was a guest on the very, very famous Art Bell show in 2002 and disappeared for eight years. <laughs> eight years. We don't know where he went, but tonight we're going to ask him. He appeared later again with Art Bell, who called in from his new um, place that he calls in every now and then, the Philippines. He's not on much recently, but actually the other, uh, the other night I heard David on his show, and I thought, I would love to have him and share his views, his ideas with our audience. So we're so lucky that tonight he said yes, and he is here with us. I want to tell you briefly just a bit more about uh, David. As time technology becomes further developed, moral and ethical issues arise. Benefits of time technology include historical studies of the past, but on the negative side, the dark side, the negative side. We could experience time wars. You've heard of water wars. Well, it appears we might have time wars with deliberate destruction of parts of the timeline, which he will talk about tonight. But he advocates, Dr. Anderson advocates, for more transparency and disclosure of the technology so that the public can have more input on how it is used, which is one of the reasons we have him here tonight, as well as he acts as an ambassador for youth for the United Nations, and he is the CEO of the World Genesis Foundation, whose mission is leave no child without hope for the future. His vision is captured in his own quote, the potential possibilities of any young mind may simply be the most fascinating, stimulating, and powerful concept in our universe. Dr. David Lewis Anderson. Let me bring him up. Dr. Anderson. Hello, Judy. Can you hear me fine tonight? Absolutely, and welcome. We are so happy to have you. Well, I'm so happy to be here with you and Rebecca tonight, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, um, I would like to just briefly ask you in your own words, I can read all the words, but I think it's always best to have the guest give their own biography. If you would be so kind, just something about yourself you'd like us all to know. Well, uh, my, 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 my two passions in my life include uh, physics, space-time physics specifically, and uh, my bio, I I spent quite amount of time uh, in school uh, in California State, West Virginia University, Joint Services Military College, and some other academies. And uh, in the process of going through my education and some wonderful opportunities given to me as a scientist in the United States Air Force, uh, I found a, a very keen interest that has overcome my, my life. And that interest is in the, uh, the study of time control technologies. Uh, I spent about five years in the Air Force, and when I couldn't convince them to continue some areas of the work, I spun out and in the 1980s uh, uh, published a, uh, a theory that we call today time warp field theory that talks about the ability to control time rates, uh, either accelerate them forward or backwards at a relatively much lower power level than was previously thought possible. In the 1990s, we set up a research lab out on Long Island, New York, we where we developed uh, what we call time warp field generators. And then, as you mentioned earlier in your prologue, we did go dark for a period of time uh, for different reasons. Um, we were building a wider network, but we have come back into the public with uh, uh, I think some very exciting news and some concerning news about what's happening around the world, not necessarily with 
our research at the Anderson Institute, but what's happening uh, through the work being done by some wonderful people all around the world uh, that could offer tremendous benefit, but also at the same time that the people of this planet really need to maybe come together on shine light on and really discuss how we apply this moving forward. The only thing that overshadows that, as you mentioned, uh, I work as an mm -hmm. ambassador for youth for both uh, the Romanian government and separately for the United Nations Educational Science and Culture Organization. And um, if the mission wasn't so important with regards to time control technology, I'd be doing that full time. Oh, all right. Well, maybe you could tell us uh, briefly, what is the Anderson Institute? Well, the Anderson Institute, it's a private research and development laboratory based in New Mexico in the United States of America. Our focus there is is threefold. We have continued uh, the development that we had originated within the organization called the TTRC. That was our laboratory out on Long Island. Uh, we have both a virtual laboratory environment. We actually have a physical operational laboratory environment, which is the second part of our mission, is defining and refining um, uh, developing and refining time warp field technology, and also something new uh, that we have recently published patent applications for, something called time reactor technology. And the third uh, aspect of our mission uh, beyond the virtual lab and simulation and the uh, operational aspects is education. Uh, we truly believe that to apply this technology wisely and for the benefit of of, of people in this world, uh, there needs to be much more transparency. And that, that really begins one of the first steps with providing a forum for people to have access to free information on what is being done around the world and ideas that they can discuss and debate together. Wow, that's what we need. And how did you become involved, um, Dr. Anderson, in time control research? What was it that put you on that path? Well, Judy, it's a great question. Uh, I, would, I wish I had something profound and inspirational, but, but in all honesty, it was by accident. And um, by accident, what I say is when I was working as a scientist, uh, I was uh, working for Air Force Systems Command at the um, Air Force Flight Test Center. I was involved in uh, the modeling, uh, detailed tests, and evaluation of high-speed space-based systems. And in the process of, of working, uh, came up with some unusual things uh, that, that I consider to be quite unusual in some models that uh, we had derived from some experiments. And in the end, it turned out to be something quite interesting, uh, something that we labeled time warp field technology that described uh, um, a very unique relationship between space and time and energy levels necessary to, uh, to couple the two. And uh, that's actually how I got involved. It was by accident and uh, hmm. worked on another project and uh, saw something interesting. And I, I made a difficult decision at the time uh, because I couldn't convince the Air Force to pursue it at the time, was to step out and pursue it on my own. Well, uh, David, why did the Air Force allow you to just go ahead and leave to pursue this work privately? Well, uh, I... Uh, there's a little bit of a story there, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief so we, we leave plenty of time for your listeners. Um, when, when, in, in this type of environment, when you're working as a scientist in advanced research and development, you have very specific missions. Uh, the cost of setting up these programs and doing these tests and evaluations are quite high. Uh, deviations from a plan are quite difficult. And what I had discovered was um, uh, something I found interesting that fell out of one of the very serious projects that we were mm -hmm. working on. Uh, I initially proposed it uh, to the test group I was working for. And uh, initially, um, Air Force Systems Command and the Air Force wasn't really responsive until about two weeks prior to my separation when they denied my separation. I had already oh. shipped my household goods away and uh, made plans for uh, uh, a new project, and uh, I actually was denied separation, and I actually had to get a congressional inquiry done to uh, uh, finish my separation because at that time um, I had already laid the groundwork for some next steps. And, and I want to be careful, Judy, uh, yeah. as, a, as a young person, uh, I'm very grateful to what the United States Air Force and Air Force Systems Command gave me. They gave me an opportunity to touch technology and experiences that I never would have got anywhere else. So it's not a negative uh, comment that I'm making. It's just that the missions were so serious, and this was on the fringe of that, that it, was, it wasn't until too late that the Air Force realized that there was something worth pursuing. 
I understand. Yeah, um, and what results did you achieve, David, at the Time Research Center on Long Island? Well, at the uh, a big part of the uh, Time Research Center on Long Island, New York, was um, uh, actually a building phase uh, to accomplish the work that we wanted to do to develop our theory and to begin practical application. We needed a facility. Uh, we needed to develop better, better simulation systems because what we were trying to do simply doesn't exist off the shelf to acquire even the support systems and the, uh, uh, the laboratory equipment and models. So we spent a lot of time building a virtual laboratory and a physical laboratory. And we actually advanced over the course uh, through about 2001-2002 uh, to what we called our third generation of time warp field technology, and or time warp field generator. And, and basically what that is, a time warp field generator is a, a system that has the ability within a small spherical field to accelerate or decelerate the rate at which time moves inside that field as compared to what's happening outside of that field. And that was the key focus of what we did there. OK. And you know, David, shortly after you, uh, your last show on Coast to Coast AM in 2002 with Art Bell, um, you did disappear. And I guess mainly you were working on all these things, right? You, di you didn't go time traveling, did you, David? <laughs> did you uh, go off? No. No, Judy, I didn't. Uh, unless maybe it was in the future to maybe uh, see if I could acquire one of Rebecca's uh, new albums from the future and come back here and make it selling it. <laughs> but, yep. um, well, Rebecca's going to ask you some questions herself. Rebecca? Yes. Um, hi, Dr. Anderson. Um, it's it's great to talk to you and hear all about this. It's uh, it's really interesting, really fascinating. So I'm honored to be able to ask you questions tonight. Um, one of the questions I have is, um, how far has your time technology advanced in those five years? Well, it's it's a great question. Um, when we were working at the um, uh, the Time Research Center on Long Island, we were able to accelerate and decelerate time rates at a rate of about 300%, meaning that we could make time move 300% faster or slower. That was right about until we hit what I would say would be our uh, third generation of time warp field generator. And going back to something Judy mentioned, Rebecca, one of the reasons we went dark is because um, the results we were seeing. Uh, when we hit our third generation of time warp field generator, we actually, we actually knew what we were doing before then. Um, when we reached that point, we had actually stumbled onto something we hadn't understand it, but had some pretty serious implications coming out of that research. And the work was so profound, and the, the, the need to protect it was so high, uh, we decided to, I don't want to sound so clandestine, but to go dark and to take the program a little more underground and underneath the radar so we could build a what I'll call as a, a, a global network or a global competency centers to give us the tools we needed to move forward. So at that point in time, uh, we, we simply needed more resources than we had in technology. And also, we felt a responsibility uh, to protect it. Um, at that point, essentially what we had discovered uh, were two things. One, the ability to drastically increase uh, the rate at which we could accelerate, uh, speed up or slow down the rate of time in a time warp field generator. And the second thing we discovered um, was something we hadn't understood before, Rebecca, was there was a source of energy in the field. And it turned out what that was um, was um, energy from, um, uh, how do I want to say it? Uh, from the effect of inertial frame dragging. It's the twisting of space-time that occurs around the Earth. Uh, I always like to make analogy like a spring. A lot of people may or may, or may not realize that as the Earth spins, it actually twists space-time. This was a theory back in the 1980s. In the 1990s, it's, it's been proven true over and over again. And what we had discovered through time warp field technology was the, the ability to basically release stored energy from that spring around the twisted space-time in the Earth. Um, that was one of the things. And we actually had accomplished a lot there. But actually, in the last eight years, we've been busy building up a network uh, that spans activities in South Korea, uh, in India, uh, and in the United States, uh, a few activities in China. 
Um, but during that process, it, it's really, uh, Rebecca, not so much about what we accomplish. What we realize is that there's four or five other co countries now that we network with and have witnessed firsthand that are very active in time control technology research, which for a scientist is very exciting, but also as a, a citizen of this, of this planet, we have to understand what the potential implications are of this technology. So the technology has gone quite far to the point that it's not just the Anderson Institute or one or two organizations, agencies, or governments. It's a series of, uh, of very well-funded uh, separate entities around the world really pursuing the technology. Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's very interesting. Can you tell us more about time-warped field technology? Yeah, time warp field technology essentially is is a it's a way um, to create a field. Uh, uh, initially, when we started, we were making fields that would be measured in a few centimeters, uh, uh, and eventually, the third generation, we reached a, a, a width of about one meter to create a spherical field that's induced using a chemical reagent, uh, a high energy laser array, and electromagnetic fields that essentially creates a field that once um, initiated, um, the power level significantly drops. But at that point, we have the ability essentially to tune that field uh, to accelerate, to speed up, or to slow down the rate of time inside. And that was the basic of, basis of time warp field theory um, and our time warp field generators. What we didn't realize and what we didn't understand is that once we initiated a time warp field in the laboratory, the power levels dropped significantly, a lot less than we thought <clears throat> would be required to maintain a, a time warp field. And we didn't really understand for, wow, more than a decade what we had there. Uh, we just knew there was a source of energy. And we finally realized that what, what a time warp field generator was doing was essentially, again, accessing stored potential energy in the twisted space-time around the, the, the planet as it rotates, mm, which creates okay. a great opportunity for a free and clean energy. Mm, that is it. So are the, I, I'm assuming that would include the benefits. And what other benefits um, you and your organization would like to achieve with this technology? Oh, uh, the benefits. Um, there would be tremendous impact on society, um, especially once this becomes public, not just from the Anderson Institute, but from these other agencies around the world. Um, uh, a lot of people talk about the ability to solve some of the world's greatest problems, uh, uh, to solve, to go into the future or to retrieve information of the future to, uh, to generate cures for you know, diseases like cancer, diabetes, and AIDS. Uh, People talk about the ability to uh, go into the past um, uh, without a lot of uh, good basis for it, but to go into the past to maybe avert some of the great catastrophes. The problem with that is that the ripple effect or butterfly effect of moving information or matter back into time does change a historical timeline, which is a great concern, obviously. Um, and the mm -hmm. ripple effect or, or butterfly effect from that is very, very difficult. Some of the other benefits, uh, historians would love to use the technology to um, see what actually uh, happened on the planet. I talk with television producers quite regularly that are producing either movies or documentaries. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we always joke about how nice it would be to actually include footage um, from the actual <laughs> event documentary. And then we all agree at the end, after a lot of laughing, that actually probably more boring than all the special effects that you see on TV today. So, uh, but we could answer some of the greatest questions about history, uh, that, uh, that also being a double-edged sword. Uh, we, could, we could catalog extinct species of plants and animals. Uh, we could have knowledge of past events. Uh, unfortunately, though, also, some of the knowledge of past events could have a major impact on society. Uh, we talk about the foundations of many religions that move back uh, through the historical timeline to one significant event. If those were proven to be true, it would have a dramatic impact on society. If those were proven to be false, they would have an equally dramatic impact on society. Um, uh, there are so many ways uh, that the technology uh, can be used. But the, the real challenge is, Rebecca, um, the, the range of technological possibilities that we're reaching, and not just us again, it, this, this isn't really a, um, a discussion about the Anderson Institute. My message is really uh, to people living all around the world that, that the capabilities have become so enormous at some of these institutions. And we've hit a point where the acquisition of knowledge and power 
puts us in a critical position. In the past, our, our human race has been able to, what I want to say is we develop more knowledge and power, we've been able to develop a greater sense of moral responsibility. And while we've danced on the edge of that razor, we've never really fallen off it, maybe in a, a, a global catastrophe or world-ending way. But until recently, we could say that work then, that, that principle, that our human capacity for moral reasoning kept play, pace with our developments in our knowledge and power and our technology. But when you look at the capabilities of some of these time-controlled technologies, we've reached a critical point. The, the, the gap between our capacity for moral and ethical reasoning and the potential impact of this technology is just getting too wide. And it's getting wider. And the scientific community is, uh, uh, even those scientists I know outside of the Anderson Institute are very split. They, uh, but I'd say the majority now want to see uh, this technology made public in full transparency on everything being done worldwide. Yes, hello again, Judy. Hi, how are you? Doing great. And, I have um, to be doing great after hearing that wonderful song. I know, <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> she rocks. No, you know, she she you does. Know, Judy, I have, a, I have a question for you. Am I allowed sure. to ask questions on this show, or is it just Absolutely. Uh, your you can ask anything you want. Well, maybe I can take the answer offline, but uh, we're producing a, a new documentary that talks about some of the... Um, um, uh, recent developments from around the world, and I would love to speak with Rebecca to see if she might be willing to contribute one of her tracks uh, to uh, a part of the soundtrack for the documentary. Wow! Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. I would. Yeah, definitely. I'm well, sure we'll have to talk offline awesome. then. Yeah, that yeah. would be great. I will send you her email, and her email. Um, I will send up Rebecca your email. That would be wonderful. I'm so excited. Oh, you know, yeah, she. I. I am so excited because I've enjoyed her music so much and used it so many times on many shows. Um, Dr. Anderson, I wanted to ask you, how are we going to manage uh, an, a way to avoid a, a global catastrophe on this planet? I know you have the answer. <laughs> well, it's the, uh, uh, the, the first thing we have to do is when uh, we look at and I'd ask everybody to think about this. When you look at any type of scientific break breakthrough that offers the tremendous prospects, whether it be governmental power or commercial prospects, it really, like this technology, it really attracts tremendous interest and investment from both the private sector, private enterprise, and governments. And I would ask... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I would ask everybody to consider, and please not underestimate, that the financial aspirations and power of large business and the political ec and economical aspirations and power of governments is just huge. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to manage it? It is unprecedented. Um, I think, I, I, hate to, I hate to be so dramatic, but I would say as a result, I think for the first time in history, our survival uh, really demands that we begin to consider ethical responsibility, not just in the application of the science and the technology, but in the direction that we're actually trying to take in the research and development of new realities and technologies as well. What are we going to do to control this? Are there mm -hmm. going to be tremendous temptations uh, to use the technology in many beneficial ways? But as we talk about um, the improper application of this technology uh, could also um, result in a global catastrophe. Some people would say even in the extinction of the human race. The, the, when, we, when we talk about the ripple effect or the butterfly effects of modifying a, a point in the historical timeline, uh, that it's a complex web of interdependencies that make up any point in a timeline. And the very process of moving backwards or forward uh, or moving through an ex a region of accelerated time or slowed down time rates it affects the reality around you, and it's almost impossible to predict. Uh, we, you know, we need to we need to talk about as we follow this. Uh, we see how important it is that the public get involved in this. Uh, while the benefits may be obvious and so wonderful, they're not science fiction anymore. But by, by using these technologies, we do risk changing the very makeup of our reality. And we don't really know what the long-term impact is, not just on the planet, on the human race, on individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But how do we to judge what benefits are useful? We talked about, I mentioned the complex web of interdependencies. Uh, it, it really seems beyond our capacity to predict the impact of changing even a small event in history. We don't know how it affects human evolution. Um, we might, by changing even a small event, we might put the, this planet and the human race and every living creature on it on the cusp of forcing maybe a quick rate of change that wasn't part of the natural original timeline. It's not saying that we should turn our back on developments in this area. I get asked that question a lot, Judy. But mm -hmm. uh, I always say it's too late. I don't say that in a negative way. It's oh. too late. Too many people are active, as I mentioned, all around the world. Uh, there are at least six competency centers I've visited, separate from the Anderson, Anderson Institute, that are active in this. And mm -hmm. to solve this problem, I, 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 think, I think we do have answers. Uh, some of the questions are, what do we do with the knowledge? How do we handle it? Who should have access to it, uh, given that its, it, its implications could touch just about anything and anyone on this planet? So our recommendations are a few part, uh, which I think was the heart of your question. Um, I think the onus has to start on the scientific community. We have to um, spend more time uh, understanding and and ensuring ourselves and peers and the public that there are no long-term negative consequences in the use of time control technology. One of the only ways to do that is we need to provide complete transparency. We need every agency uh, to provide complete transparency and disclosure to every detail of not only the technology's actual use, but also the development. And it's also important that we refine our capacity for moral reasoning so that we're equipped to answer uh, the moral challenges. This is a brand new situation. We talked about technologies that could be globally catastrophic, held, held in the hands of man, like nuclear technology. Uh, this is even larger, perhaps. And we're not really equipped now to address the moral challenges. So I think one of the things that we have to do is a way is develop a moral compass that will guide the application of this. And that moral compass can't be held by a few people or a small group of people. We need a public involvement, very, very critically self-aware uh, or, or aware of what's being done. Um, and we need that huge global collective effort, more than it's ever been seen on this planet before, to govern its, govern its use. And to do that, um, so we need transpose, transparency, we need disclosure, we need a global collective effort. But to begin that, the first thing is we need is an educational imperative that can be directed to everybody in the world. And we need to get that um, global collective consciousness involved in guiding how the world uses this technology. That's not an easy thing to do, because nobody's ever done it before. Um, but perhaps in a way, given the potential impact that this technology could have, in many ways, we also feel why the task is daunting to try to build a moral compass guided by the collective global consciousness that will span geographic borders, religious borders, political borders. We also see that the, the powerful implications of the technologies actually might be something that could unify the world and make people step and look across those boundaries. All right. And um, I know this might seem a little bit out of uh, context, but I understand that your institute holds several patents for time reactor design. Uh, could you just give us a brief explanation of what is a time reactor? Oh, uh, yeah, actually there's a, there's, a good, um, uh, there, there's a lot of good information on our website with regards to um, the uh, uh, a time reactor, but essentially what a time reactor is, it is a device uh, that has the capability to uh, tap into the stored potential energy um, that exists in the curved space-time around the Earth. Okay, a lot of words there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, imagine it this way. Most, most systems that harvest energy, there's a potential energy out there. It might be the potential energy in wind. It might be the, uh, the potential energy in a nuclear event. It might be the potential energy stored in what people call gravity. Um, and and it, it's also the potential energy stored, say, in some of the earliest clocks, a spring. And what a time reactor does um, is it, 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 it basically is a system uh, that's based upon time warp field technology, but it's a system that extracts that potential energy from curved space-time. And 
which is that spring around the Earth. Again, as the Earth spins, um, it actually not only deforms space-time, but it actually twists it. And if the Earth was not there, um, say for, you know, hypothetically, all of a sudden the Earth were just to simply vanish, um, that spring would snap back with a level of force that is, oh, I would say quite difficult to comprehend. Uh, to be very specific, if you look at the energy, basically the potential energy in the stored Earth, uh, it's roughly about 2.1 times 10 to the 29th joules. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the total electric usage of all Americans for an entire year for 60,000 million years. Mm -hmm. um, it's a tremendous amount of, uh, it's billions and billions and billions of of, of, of times more potential energy than that used by the entire human race through mm -hmm. the whole existence of life on this planet. Um, it's a tremendous amount of power uh, that's available there. And essentially what a time reactor does, it's a, it's a system that has the ability to tap into that potential energy. Amazing. Well, I would love for you to share with everyone your website, uh, Dr. Anderson. I have it written on our show description page, but if you would like to share that, that would be great. Sure. Our website, it's, uh, it's andersoninstitute.com, www.andersoninstitute.com. Uh, one note for anybody who comes there, one of the things... Uh, the human race has struggled through history to understand time. A lot of people ask me, why do we have so much diverse information on our website? Mm -hmm. We're scientists. I'm a physicist by background. Um, right. I understand mathematics, engineering, physics, uh, and that's it. And people always ask, well, why do we have such a diverse um, uh, consolidation of information? Because essentially, mankind has been struggling to understand time and our place in it uh, since people were walking this planet. And we truly believe that the only way to truly understand such a complex subject is a multidisciplinary approach, a non-judgmental one. We post mm -hmm. a lot of information there. So we believe and we encourage people who study the ability to control time through the power, the innate power and capabilities within the human mind. Uh, we talk about art, the expression of time in art. We talk about uh, how time has been viewed by philosophers. We talk about time in physics. Uh, it's a form for free education. It's one of those first steps that we talked about as part of the global solution to build that moral compass. The first step is education, followed by transparency, disclosure, and then uh, guidance by a global collective effort. Absolutely. Rebecca, um, I think you have a question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm curious as to what is the most interesting observation you have made in your lab regarding time? Well, there's two of them. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what other people's are and then what mine is. Uh, when people have the ability to stand uh, only a few meters away from a field and to see uh, time rates actually to see objects in motion actually speed up or slow down contrary to what they realize they perceive as real in their reality. Uh, the reaction from them to witness a time warp field generator in operation or time warp field in action is, is um, uh, for them is the most interesting thing. Uh, for me, Besides the accidental discovery that what we were seeing in power levels was linked to inertial frame dragging, that spinning, twisting space-time around the Earth, for me, my favorite reaction, that observation I've made, is watching people observe it for the first time because it's a very profound effect. Because when you realize and you can see firsthand how time can be simply sped up or slowed down or stopped or reversed, and you see that first time, the reaction from a person because the way we hold on to our, our, our sense of reality, which is limited by our own minds and bodies' perceptions, is mm -hmm. first it's disbelief. Then it moves <laughs> to laughter and very emotion. And the most amazing thing to me, and this gets to answering your question, Rebecca, is mm -hmm. what happens one or two weeks later when I might bump into those people via a phone call or uh, another meeting, and mm -hmm. they tell me they can no longer look at life and their reality the same way because there, our minds and bodies' perceptions are so limited in what we can understand. And when you realize how fluid the nature of time is and what it really is, um, it really does affect your ability to go through. Because, you know, we're human beings. Our, our human minds 
at least the scientists I speak to, have a very simple function. They're to rationalize what we sense and see with our own senses, which are very limited, with our belief system in our mind. Um, mm -hmm. And until you see something, sometimes it's it, it's quite difficult to do that. And we're also guilty as a society sometimes of shrinking all the magic in our world to the size of our daily routine and material possessions. We don't just open our eyes sometimes. And uh, I think that's an important message for, for most people. All we have to do is really open our eyes, step back, and uh, there's some amazing things that make up this reality around us, even though we only see a small microscopic part of it. Wow, that would be interesting to witness. People seeing that, I can't even imagine what that would be like or what it's like for them. That's amazing. Um, what are your thoughts about paradoxes? Uh, paradoxes are places where people's rational minds bump into their own limitations. That's what I think. Um. Uh, it's, it, it is so true, and it, it kind of goes back, Rebecca. It's a good leading question you just asked from the previous conversation. Uh, our senses are very limited. Our minds, they sense things, and our human brain's function is to rationalize it with a belief system. It takes a lot of training for people um, to break that barrier. There are people who do it. There are people who dedicate. Um, and we're really excited by people who are working on aspects of remote viewing or time control through the power of the human mind. Uh, we encourage it. I'm jealous, actually. I wish I had more opportunity to have that type of experience and training. Um, there are cultures around the world that simply don't have a concept of time. Um, I've had a chance, I think, on four or five occasions now, four occasions, five actually, to sit down with a Buddhist monk, a senior Buddhist monk, and to ask them the question uh, about time. And you speak with them, and they're confused because they don't understand why people think that time moves. Um, huh. uh, but the, the, per per the perceptions around time um, we're, we're so limited by our biological evolution, our cultural evolution, and that's important. You know, a lot of people listen to that and they'll say, oh, blah, 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 this is a whole bunch of, uh, of hoopla, just, just let it go. Um, but uh, one, one argument people need to think about who, who are in that mode listening to you now, perhaps, is to think about cultures. There's cultures in Africa that have no concept of time in their language or in mm -hmm. within their culture. The language of the Navajo Indians never had a past, present, or future tense in their language. Can you imagine that? Our, our culture is so inundated with that little mechanism called a clock and, and the numbers around it. Um, we can't even utter one or two sentences without tripping onto that. But the Navajo Indians never talked about the temporal quality of event, only its actual quality of happening. Um, our views, senses of time, are, are, are simply cultural evolution. They're biological evolution. They're sensory limitations. And to, to make a first step, we simply have to overcome that, realize those are limited. Once you do, then the learning can begin about some of the very interesting things in the field. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts about um, parallel universes? Um, parallel universes. Uh, I actually got in trouble on Art Bell's show for talking about this, <clears throat> and I'll say that jokingly. Uh, we believe in parallel universes, but not like, not not in the same manner. What we observe in the laboratory supports the concept of parallel universes, but in a, a, a very, very different way. Uh, a lot of people use parallel universes to overcome paradoxes. Um, uh, a lot of people would like to think that if you go back in time and uh, you change something, your original timeline stays in place, but the a new parallel timeline with the new timeline that you've changed and affected spins off in another direction. We don't believe in that kind of parallel universe. Um, we see moving through time like moving through space. When you move through space, you make changes and you disrupt things, and while you can return, you've changed and disrupt things. And the same is true moving through time. It, it's very similar only some minor differences, but it's very similar to moving through space. When you move through time, uh, essentially the very process disrupts the timeline and the construct of that reality. So a, a lot of paradoxes, um, there's a tremendous number of paradoxes that you study in college physics uh, uh, that once you understand uh, special relativity, Einstein's theories of special relativity and basic space-time physics, they're not paradoxes. They're limitations of the human mind because we can't see it, so we've evolved not to understand it. But once you, uh, once you reach that point, those types of paradoxes, why they don't seem natural to us, can be explained in the laboratory. The other types of paradoxes 
are quite difficult, those paradoxes that are really ingrained deeply in the human mind and how we perceive time. But parallel universes we do believe in uh, to some degree. Uh, for example, when we have a time reactor um, and we, what we observe clearly in the laboratory is the case that when we couple what we call the space-time mode of force, that's the potential energy across a region of curved space-time, we see that energy. Matter of fact, the whole foundation of the system operation is the fact that the energy travels through two paths, one that would, some people would say exists in this reality and one that is a path, an alternate path through, say, a hyperspace or a parallel universe. And I don't want to sound all of cosmic and sci-fi, it's not. It's simply just running two different paths, uh, not much different than the, you know we talk about photons and uh, beam of light experiments through uh, slits and the fact that uh, so many scientists now today do believe in parallel universes. I think even Stephen Hawking stepped out uh, just about a month or two ago and, and acknowledged uh, uh, his belief now in parallel universes. We just see them a little bit different based on our observations and what other people see them. Yeah, yeah. Just to switch gears a little bit, I know that you're, I, I'm a teacher, and I know you're active as an ambassador for youth around the world, and I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. Oh, uh, thank you so much for raising that, because you, this is dangerous. If you get me talking about this, Rebecca, I'll talk all night long, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short. I understand. Okay. Um, I, I, am, I have some wonderful partners, and we run a foundation. It's called the World Genesis Foundation. Its mission is to leave no child without hope for the future, and we, we focus in areas of the world where children basically have no opportunities. Um, uh, through that work, I started that, uh, oh, I, I would say, roughly about uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, we continue to expand that. We do programs in Eastern Europe, in Asia, uh, different parts of the world. Um, I, I also work actively as an ambassador for youth for the Romanian government, uh, which is a, a lot of our work has focused in Eastern Europe. And uh, we have one of our partners who works in the Romanian government there. So uh, through time, I've become an ambassador youth for their government. And also, I, I work as an ambassador for youth for the United Nations Educational Science and Culture Organization, focusing really on creating educational opportunities for youth living in situations where they have none, maybe only facing a, a life of exploitation and abuse. And um, if anybody wants to read about that, uh, we have a, uh, a site at the World Genesis, uh, worldgenesis.org, and uh, or you can find links on our Anderson Institute website as well. Great, thank you. Wow. Um, you know, Dr. Anderson, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about, um, do you have any new books or documentaries, or what, what can we look forward to coming from your institute? Um, well, we have well, we have a number of things, and actually, uh, the first first one, one item we have is we do have a documentary. It's called Time Travel Journeys into Time. Uh, it's essentially a one hour documentary about mankind's struggle uh, throughout history uh, to wrestle with the understanding of time, whether it's the understanding of time from a scientific perspective, um, understanding it. Uh, uh, from a physics perspective, how it's expressed in art, its expression in religion and spirituality, what some of the state of the art uh, in technology was at that time. It's called Time Travel Journeys into Time. It's available on Amazon.com. Uh, the other thing that's very important to me, as I mentioned, uh, a big part mm -hmm. to avoid, a, um, to ensure that we avoid as, 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 a, as a human race a global catastrophe with use of technology as education. And our website is a, is a good source of free information for people. We work with scientists and teachers all around the world. Uh, we get their permission to uh, publish and provide a central consolidated information base of some of the best information on time, whether it be about art in time, religion in time, spirituality in time, time control of the mind, physics in time. Uh, it, it's a great form. And the other thing I'm really excited about, uh, we've created quite a stir uh, recently uh, with announcing some of the work that's going on around the world in some of the other institutions as well. Uh, look for a new documentary from us in about three months. It's, it's underway. We're just going into final editing really soon, and, and hopefully we'll have it out the door uh, before summer. Great. And everyone, I want you to know you can find that on Dr. Anderson's website. And his website is, go ahead, Dr. Anderson, give everyone your website. It is andersoninstitute.com. Great. And um, I want to know, do you have any closing message to our listeners that you would like them to consider? 
Yes. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Do I have one minute, one hour? <laughs> no, 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 no. You have several minutes. Go right ahead. Several minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. if I About can, four. <laughs> okay. I would remind everybody that we're all part of the same uh, global system here. Um, the, the time control technology is no longer sci-fi. Uh, there are efforts underway in China. Japan, in out north of Kyoto City, has a wonderful institute doing fantastic work in applying technology. We know Russia is involved, but we don't know to what level. India, um, in the Masharastra, Mashra district, uh, in, uh, state of Masharastra, in the Pune district, has one as a time control technology facility that is 10 times larger than anything else in the world and 10 times further ahead than anybody else in the world. South Korea is pursuing application of the technology right now. It's no longer a question of if, it's now. And with that, for your, your listeners, uh, don't, don't believe me. Make your own decisions. That's what we're trying to encourage. But to ensure that the people of this planet and this world really benefits from this technology and all the wonderful things that can happen and averts a global catastrophe, we have to campaign for full disclosure and transparency. We have to shine light on what's being done. We have to bring the global conscious effort into this to develop a moral compass and to begin all that to do something that's, which will be doing something never been done before. We have to educate ourselves. And we want to try to provide a forum, a lot of free educational information on our website. Please take a look at it. And I'd implore you, if you don't find what you need, contact me. If you have a question, please contact me. You can find me via the website or on Facebook. And Judy and Rebecca, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you tonight. And I really do thank you for the opportunity.